Hi, I'm Terrell Turner, the host of the Finance and Accounting Show. And today I have on the show, Captain Hoff. He is a Silicon Valley, I would say, phenomena with all the great things that he's putting out and really helping a lot of entrepreneurs understand what you need to know to be successful in some very critical areas of your business. So you definitely want to stay tuned. Welcome to another episode of the Finance and the Accounting Show. This is the place to go for small business owners. If you're looking for a great way to understand the finance and the accounting side of your business, you're in the right place. So stay tuned and enjoy the episode. So without further ado, let me bring on Captain Hobb. Welcome to the show. Fantastic to be here. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's always a pleasure, like I said, to have so many people from different backgrounds and different perspectives because I always tell people is finance and accounting, I just admit, I, it's my background, but it's not the most important part of the business, but it is, it's interrelated to very important parts of the business. So it's always great to have other guests on from different areas and different backgrounds. My pleasure. And I always tell people, if you don't get your finances in order, you're in trouble, no matter what business you're running. <laughs> so you better understand it. I love it. I love it. So before we jump into the, like I said, the amazing work that you do and, and all the great resources, the books and the materials you put out, tell us a little bit about your background. So I come from an interesting background. So I have two sides to me, one very technical, I'm an electrical computer engineer and one creative. So I went and got my master's degree in film and television. In my entire career, I've been working at the intersection of technical and creative. So I've been a Hollywood television development executive. I worked in Japan as a guy who comes up with new ideas for games for one of the largest game companies. I came back to my home, which is the San Francisco Bay Area, started my first game startup had a huge success there. And then I just kept doing startup after startup after startup. And after my third venture funded startup, I took a break and all my friends started to come to me and they're like, <laughs> Captain Hop, you know, how'd you do it? How do we raise venture capital? How do we put together a business plan? How, you know, where do we go to get all these resources? And I knew the answers. So I started what is called Founder Space, which is a startup incubator and accelerator. So it's a place where we bring in entrepreneurs, everything from the idea stage all the way through people are launching products that are growing like crazy, and we help them actually go faster. We help them grow faster. We help them connect with the people they need to connect with. We help them raise venture capital, everything they need to kind of get to the next level. Wow, I think that is amazing. I was like, the first thing that I want to ask is on electrical engineering and then the more creative side. Did you ever feel like there was like this war of like the logical and the creative mind going on in your head? Absolutely. So I grew up in a household that mirrored this. So my mother was an artist. And my father was literally a rocket scientist at MIT. So that's what he was. So these are like two polar opposites. So my brain is kind of a fusion of the DNA from both sides and the influences from both sides. And as you can see, I've been uh, I've been in between both worlds. And you know, it's been challenging sometimes. You know, part of me is just a dreamer. I want to go off and do crazy stuff, whether it's practical or not, <laughs> whether there's a financial model behind it or not. And then my other part is uh, much more analytical. You know, should I really do this? Should I take the risk? Is it worth this? So there's an interplay. And I think the interplay has made me a better entrepreneur because, you know, part of me is just this risk taker, this dreamer will go out and just dive into something without knowing anything about it, but is willing to, you know, see what happens. And then the other part of me is like, darn worried about my finances. I'm losing everything I have on this deal, you know. There's a rule I made, and this is a financial rule. And I encourage a lot of entrepreneurs to think about this very carefully. I said, I'm going to do some crazy businesses here. You know, some of them are going to work out. Some of them don't. I actually wrote a whole book on this, Surviving a Startup, because, you know, most startups fail. That's just a fact. Like the majority of startups fail, so the odds are stacked against you. So I kind of knew this intuitively when I did my first startup that, you know, there's a high probability it will fail. Luckily, it didn't. But you know, people offered me money, like my cousin offered me money, my parents, you know, were willing to back me. 
but I decided I don't want to take friends and family money. Like the worst thing you can do, you know, is to take somebody's money and then lose it. Like even if they're like your friend and they really care about you, the rest of their life, they'll be thinking, you lost my money. Like, I, <laughs> you know, they can't, you lost my money. And then you're going, and then if you go on it and are successful after that, they're even more annoyed. Like, you lost my money on your first startup and then you made a billion dollars on your second one. Like, you know, where's my payback? You know? No, but seriously, if you go, if you go to Thanksgiving dinners, things like that, the last thing you want coming between you and other people is money. And also these people, family and friends, they don't really understand the risk they're taking. They don't know that there's a, you know, they have better odds going to Vegas than betting it on your crazy <laughs> startup idea. So, so I encourage people, look, if you can't get a professional investor, somebody outside your friends and family circle, somebody who uh, can evaluate your business objectively and really understands the risk involved. If you can't get them to commit money, why should you get your friends and family to do it? You know, <laughs> are you going to learn on their dime? If you have a good enough business, if you get it into good enough shape, you should be able to get an investor. So if you, so I tell, tell people just, you know, you want to keep those relationships and you want to keep them, especially when you're not, you're, if your company fails, you're going to need a shoulder to cry on. And if you've just lost somebody's money, they're not really happy that you're crying on their shoulder. <laughs> because you should be working, not crying on my shoulder. They want money back. So that's, that's my first rule. Gotcha. I, I think that is amazing. I mean, because, you know, it, it's one of those things where I, I would say I, I can definitely see why you've been very successful. I mean, I think on the first hand of just being able to have that ability about you to dream and, and, and to see, you know, hey, how big can this thing be? But also having that practical side of yourself is just like, all right, yes, it's great for us to dream big, but okay, all right, now we got to put some legs under this dream so it can kind of stand up. And, and you mentioned about your book. So can we talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of the things people can expect when they pick up that book, Surviving Startup? So when you pick up Surviving a Startup, it's basically everything from decades of my own experience, you know, doing three venture funded startups, two bootstrap startups. I've done both. And then also I coach and mentor hundreds of startups around the world every year. You know, Founder Space, we're in 22 countries now. So we're all over the world oh. working with entrepreneurs. And as I engage with entrepreneurs, I am always learning something. So I am seeing like the, the problems that they're facing, like in each of every business is different. You know, you see, but you start to see patterns where people make mistakes, what they don't do right. So what I did is I basically, it's all that knowledge. Like, look, if you're going down this path, you're in trouble. And, and, and what do you do? How do you change direction? How do you go up? How do you speak to investors? How do you raise capital? What are the things, you know, how, how do investors think when they look at your business? How do you scale your business? How do you grow it? How do you manage employees and fire them? All of that. It's like all in the one book. Wow. That is a ton of value. I mean, that, that, I guess, how long did it take you to actually write the book? You know, I know this like the back of my hand, like I've been doing it <laughs> for decades <laughs> and uh, so all the knowledge was there. It still takes a long time to write a book. Like, you know, by the time you're all done, it's a, it's easily a year. But I knew exactly what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it. And my, you know, the books I like to read, especially when they're nonfiction, like are just packed with really useful information that you can apply. Like, what can I do to get overcome this problem that I'm having or that I will have in the future? Can you tell me? So that's the type of book I wrote. Wow. I love it. I love it. I mean, when you're working in the world of startups or just, you know, just entrepreneurs in general, I mean, it's just, there's so many different topics that come up and you and I were talking, you know, before we, we you know, we, we came on to the recording, we we're talking about like, you know, some of those financial decisions that people are trying to navigate, whether it's cash flow, whether it's headcount. Can you talk a little bit about kind of something you've seen as it as it relates to like hiring people and like timing and the financial implications of those decisions? Absolutely. So uh, I made a big mistake in my first venture funded startup. Like our engineering team when we started was three people, like three amazing engineers. And they worked like crazy to get our product live. We closed a big deal with MTV and Viacom for, you know, 
for them to use our platform. They were kind of burning out. So I said to them, you know, we, we just raised $6 million and we're raising more money. Go, go, go to town, hire as many engineers <laughs> as you want. I thought I was being nice. I was actually setting them up for failure because when you're hiring people, it's not the number of people that count. It's the quality. And they yes. didn't really, they were engineers. They didn't really understand how to vet uh, the and hire the best people possible. And they hired too many too fast. So they, so what that ended up happening for us was we had these three amazing engineers. Now they had to keep our system running. They had to keep our system growing because we we're adding new customers. They had to go through the whole hiring process, which anybody who doesn't know, it's, you know, it's very time consuming. And then they had to get these engineers up to speed. And some of them weren't like crack engineers, like they weren't the best of the best. So mm -hmm. they were on, instead of solving their problem by actually giving them license to do that, I, I let them dig their own grave. They didn't actually die, but right? they were fine, <laughs> but it was a real growing pains, right? We, we, we overhired too fast and we didn't pay enough attention to quality. That was one thing. Another thing is cash flow. Like, you know, my company raised a lot of money really fast. It seemed like a ton of money to us because we went from almost starving to like having millions of dollars. You need to treat every penny carefully. Like from the day you raise it, like don't. <laughs> just waste it, like use it strategically, effectively. It doesn't mean don't spend it. Don't sit on your money. That's not what venture capitalists want. They actually will pressure you to spend the money, but you need to spend it where you, it really makes a difference. And I will tell you what really venture capital is best at. And a lot of people don't realize it. Venture capital is not best at, at getting plush offices. It's not best used for um, figuring things out for kind of like going into the marketplace and experimenting and doing stuff. It's best used when you have a business, you've figured out exactly who your customer is. You, you, you need to acquire more customers. The, the venture capital primarily should be used for acquiring customers and then building the team to support them. Those two things are what are kind of the rocket fuel that propel these startups. And if you haven't figured out the, this is a cardinal rule. Of, of raising capital. If you haven't figured out a product that is literally just flying off the shelf, like people like can't get enough of it, they, they need your product. If that isn't happening, don't raise money. Like, because the money can actually hurt you. I have seen startups in Silicon Valley that have literally raised hundreds of millions of dollars. And they're companies that you may have heard of, you may not have, because they no longer exist. The one company was boo.com, B-O-O.com, another fab.com, F-A-B.com. And there are a whole bunch of others. They raised these hundreds of millions of dollars, but they hadn't really figured out who their customer were, was and what wow. their customer really needed. So they ended up using these hundreds of millions. It's like, how can you fail if you've given hundreds of millions of dollars? Like, you know, when you're a startup, you're struggling. Like just, you know, if I had a hundred million dollars, it wouldn't matter what I did. Well, it does matter what you do. Because what they did was they ended up acquiring tons of customers. But those customers would come, they try their product, and they would leave. And then they masked the problem by raising more money and, and oh, <laughs> doing wow. more. So it seemed like they were growing, right? Because their revenue was going up. But all that revenue was at a loss. Like the, it, the, there was no profit. They were actually in the red for every customer they acquired. Venture wow. capital, and this is, this is where venture capital really works. Venture capital only works when you figure out what it costs to acquire a customer at scale and that amount to acquire that customer and over the lifetime of use with your product, the, that customer has to generate significantly more money than you acquired them for. So that at the end of the day, you have a real profit. If that equation works out, you can raise as much venture capital as you want because literally you're just paying, you're, you're literally, they are loaning you money to acquire customers in advance and they will get paid back later. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we'll give you $50 million, go out and get all the customers because we know we've looked at your model that, you know, your churn rate is this, the customer retention is this, all this stuff in the long run, these customers, you're going to be profitable. You are going to be profitable. That if you know that go, go to town, like raise as much money as you can, because you want to dominate the market. If you haven't figured that out yet and you're raising lots of money, you know, what it does is it locks you into a position like you're going to, because you raise money on a certain 
business model, right? But if that business model is fundamentally broken, it's happened many, many times, you are literally going to go off a cliff at some point. As soon as that money, wow. as soon as that spigot, <laughs> that cash spigot turns off, literally because you're losing money, you're and there's no way the, these customers are going to leave. They're never going to pay off your debt. Wow. Wow. I, I think that is an amazing reality that unfortunately, I don't know if enough startups and enough business owners actually see and understand that perspective. Yeah, I, I tell entrepreneurs early on in their business, like you need to figure out your business for yourself, not to raise money. Raising money isn't your end goal. Like, look, you know, you usually raise the money when you don't really need it. Like what I say is the money helps, of course, but you have figured out a business and it works. That means mm -hmm. your business works. It could survive, but raising the money takes it from business growing slowly accelerates it like we see these unicorns mm -hmm. boom on the way to ipo that's what venture capital is good at it's not good at anything else <laughs> if you're in the <laughs> no if you're in the r d phase like you're you can raise a little money but really you want to raise just enough money to have like a core team and then you're mm -hmm. out there in the market experimenting like i'll try this um, it doesn't work i'll try no i'll try that 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 discovery phase you want to keep uh, you want to raise as only the bare minimum amount of money to actually and keep your team really small because if you raise too much money again in the discovery phase and you don't discover what you think you're or it takes longer <laughs> you have to pay these team members and then you're in a world of hurt because your burn yeah. rate is really high keeping it really low getting a team that's committed for the long term because they like they believe in it they have an equity stake they're going to stick with you even you know if you don't have a lot of money and picking a business picking a business that you can, the best businesses, the highest chance of success, if you want to succeed, is picking a business where it's sweat equity. It's what your team puts into it that that uh, that creates most of the value. In other words, you don't need a lot of capital to prove out your model. You guys uh, and gals can, can get together and maybe it's three or four of you, or even two of you, and within six months or a year, on no money at all, because usually it's very hard to raise money, you can make significant progress towards actually finding out where in the market there is pent up demand, this pent up demand like an oil gusher that none of the other competitors have met. If you can find that first, figure out how to tap it, boom, then you go raise capital. Wow. Wow, I, I love the strategy. I love, you know, the way that you break that down and, and keep it so simple because. It's one of those things that I think about after you've seen a couple of startups that raise capital and you end up asking yourself, like, how did they go from raising all this money to not even existing anymore? And I guess as that happened, um, do you I guess in your opinion, do you believe VCs will get a little bit more, I guess will scrutinize companies a little bit more before they start investing? So there are a lot of different types of VCs out there. You know, there are venture capitalists who are really experienced. Uh, we call them smart money in Silicon Valley. They they are very good at picking these companies. And then there are venture capitalists who are kind of new to the game and angel investors who are new. And it's sort of like a crapshoot for them. <laughs> They're like investing in stuff, <laughs> hoping something turns out. But let's take the really good ones. Even the really good ones never they, they don't have a perfect track record. There's nobody out there who's done a number of investors, a number of investments that has a perfect track record. The bottom line is that when, when you set up a venture fund, what you're doing is you're playing a, a portfolio game. So it's much like the entertainment business that I used to be in. You know, movie studios, they'll put out, you know, 10 movies, 20 movies, and they're counting on one or two of them to be blockbusters, and like to make back all the loser films. It's exactly the same way in startups. You know, <laughs> your venture capital firm, every every company they invest in, they believe has the potential to become a blockbuster. Like that's why they're putting in the money because they, uh, it, but they know there is a good chance it won't. It'll either fail or just kind of, you know, limp along or even become a medium sized business. But a venture fund, their whole business model, how they're financially structured is that they need to exit their money because it's what they've done is they've raised money from other people and they need to pay those people back. And so the fund mm -hmm. has a, a finite life. It's usually 10 or 12 years, sometimes shorter. And in that period of time, they need to not only invest the money, they need to take that company all the way through to either an acquisition or IPO. Because if they don't do that, 
then they have to sell off their shares earlier at a big dis discount just to pay back their investors. And they don't want to be in that position. This is why hyper growth companies are the game for venture capitalists. The other reason is that when most of these companies fail, like it only takes usually in a typical fund, one company to make the fund. They call it a fund maker. This one company ends up being worth exponentially more than all the other companies put together. And that pays, that makes the fund. So they are looking for that, that, that fund maker. They're placing all their bets on the table and they are saying, well, all these companies seem like they could be that super unicorn, but you know, I know they, they all won't go that path. Right. But if one of them is we've, we've made it, our fund is successful. If two of them are, wow, <laughs> we can, we can write our own check for the next, you know, for the next fund. So that's the game. That's how venture capital think. That's how they work. That's how the financial models are structured. Wow, so much insight. I mean, I, I love love all the wisdom that you're sharing. And now you've talked about the book and you've talked about Founder Space. So where can people find you know a copy of the book and where can they find Founder Space online? Uh, Founder Space is super simple. Founderspace.com. You just go there. It's right in front of you right now. And we have tons of resources. As you can see on the website, we have online startup programs. We have places where you can send in your business plan for our venture capital team to review it, my books, we have podcasts, and lots of uh, free videos and resources to train entrepreneurs. So just founderspace.com. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, before we wrap up, and you've given us so much wisdom already, but I always like to ask before we wrap up, you know, what's two pieces of advice that you would leave for entrepreneurs and business owners? So one piece of advice is when you are coming up with a new idea, don't think that the idea is what matters. The idea is just a starting point. It's where you enter the market. If you're trying to do something that's never been done before, something new that's going to you know, really make a big impact, then you, that first idea you have is probably wrong. So really go into the market with an open mind saying, ah, this is one, just one of many ideas I'm going to have. And my job isn't to prove this idea is right. My job is actually to see where this idea takes me. And my mission is to discover demand. Where is that demand that nobody else has met? None of the competitors out there. Where is it? Can I tap into it? That's number one. Number two, to talk about finance. If you're raising venture capital, if you really want to succeed, don't go with your PowerPoint like everybody does. Go through your pitch. You know, ha have the investor say yes or no, and then go on to the next one. You know, so many entrepreneurs do this over and over. No. When you go to pitch investors, it should be, first of all, an interactive process. You should not be doing all the talking. You should be getting them into a dialogue with you because for two reasons. Number one is you can learn a lot. Like even if they say no, these people are really experienced. Like you got in the room with them, you'd be paying them a thousand dollars or more an hour consulting. Use their brain, get their feedback on your business. <laughs> Number two, investors like entrepreneurs that they can communicate with. That's part of the test. It's not just what's in your business plan. And if they give you an idea, they, you know, anybody who hasn't their own ideas, they start to get excited about your business. If you engage them in thinking about it and you ask them their opinions and what you could do better and where, what's the real potential for this business, come up with a list of questions that you can ask the venture capital, not just questions they can ask you. Really important, you can see how you work together. Very good. That and the fact that go, doing a dialogue in these environments is a great way to go through the process. And as you do that dialogue, pay very special attention to the reaction of the venture capitalists, like what they say, how they react, because you should be going back after every pitch, every time you pitch a venture capitalist and rewriting your business plan. Literally, there's something you could improve on it. I don't care how good your business plan is. Mm -hmm. There's some nugget in that conversation that you've been having with them. And you wouldn't get this if you were just pitching them one way, but going back and forth that you can take and actually make it a better business plan. And that ups your chance. Like I got the first time I raised venture capital took me an entire year. Like I didn't know what I was wow. doing. The second time it took me six months. The third time, three months. Like it just goes faster, faster, faster because you get, <laughs> no, once you understand that, 
actually going into the venture community, you can learn a, a lot about your own business and you can iterate on your own pitch and make it better and better. You can compress that time. Awesome. I absolutely love it. Well, Captain Hoff, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for coming on as a guest. And before we wrap up, can you repeat the website one more time for those that are listening? If you want to find me on my website or any social network, founderspace.com. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Finance and Accounting Show. If you like what you heard, don't be selfish. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and then share this with a friend because you know a business owner that could definitely use this insight. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, share it with a friend, and turn on the notification bell so you get all the updates when we release a new episode.